Moving on to the barrel recoil system. These here are the components that mostly comprise up the parts for having the barrel recoil. Starting with the top, we have the main gun barrel. Here we have the actual ArmorTech recoil module. Here we have the LED photostrobe flasher. The swinging link. The link con barrel extension. A high quality servo. As well as another high quality servo arm. Starting with the barrel, as you can see since the previous scene, the all of the tooling marks which were mentioned earlier have been polished away with the sandpaper on the lathe. In addition to removing the tooling marks in this section here, a lot of polishing was done to this portion here of the barrel. The reason for that is that this is the portion of the barrel which actually recoils inside of the bushing which is found on the mantlet. Now it is a good idea to thoroughly sand and polish this portion here of the barrel as the tolerances on the kit stock are quite tight and you want to loosen them up in order for the barrel to recoil a lot more efficiently which will put less wear and tear on the servo. This has to be done by feel and after some sanding it's a good idea to test the fit of the barrel inside of the mantlet in order to get a good feel of the, the movement to make sure it's nice and smooth. After or once all these components are assembled, some grease will also be added to this portion here, which will also help glide the barrel inside of the mantlet. Furthermore, we can see that the barrel has been thoroughly primed. However, this part here has been taped off, again, because it needs to be left in bare metal in order for it to slide effortlessly inside of the bushing. Moving on to the recoil module. All this system here, as well as all the components here, are all stock with the ArmorTech recoil option pack. Now, the recoil module plugs into the ArmorTech sound system, and you have to have the ArmorTech sound system in order for the recoil module to function, as they piggyback off of each other. The instructions are very thorough in hooking up this system and patching it into the ArmorTech system, and is all illustrated in the, the well thought out instructions. This over here is your strobes. As you see, it's a cluster of bright LEDs on a very long cable. The system is very similar to that of the flash system found on the Tamiya's or even some of the Henlong 116 scale models. And the wires will all connect to the recoil module as per the kit instructions. This system was utilized on another ArmorTech build that I recently did, namely that of a late production Tiger. And Videos of that can be found on the video listings. Moving on from the photostrobe takes us to the actual link mechanism. It's comprised of two components. We have here a CNC brass extension. It's threaded on one end and threads directly into the rear portion of the ArmorTech gun barrel. It is a hollow system in order for you to run the cable of the lights through the barrel and out of the corner. It's also fully machined for the mounting of the swinging link. The swinging link is made out of a piece of steel. It's laser cut and is nicely machined in that it fits perfectly inside of the action. Now if we notice the holes are, the piece is not symmetrical as there are two sides of holes. The larger hole and the smaller hole. This is done to prevent confusion as the larger hole is for mounting onto the brass extension while the smaller holes for mounting to the servo. Once the system is fully completed it will have a toggle action similar to that like what you would find on a German Luger. As for the servo, the servo which is supplied by Armortech is from Savo. It's a very high quality servo. It's all made out of aluminum and is a very powerful unit and I've used this on again another build which was very powerful in making the heavy barrel recoil. In addition to the high quality servo, is also another high quality servo arm. Rather than utilizing a stock plastic piece, the ArmorTech kit supplies you with this Fast Tracks brand aluminum servo arm. The piece is all made out of metal and is a very robust piece which will definitely 
remove any flex, which will really aid in the barrel efficiency. And here's the barrel just prior to installation to the barrel cluster. All of the components which were mentioned in the previous scene have been assembled and added, namely that of the brass mounting lug, as well as the pivoting swinging link. Also added was that of the firing cable light. The cluster is all the way towards the front of the gun barrel, and the wire runs through the barrel and out through this section here, like was mentioned earlier. Now, one mod that I made to the piece was that I went ahead and added silicone and filled in this pool over here, which was a channel for the wire. The reason for that is that with the barrel always firing and recoiling, this unit here, the wire can work itself loose gradually over time and either move in or out of the barrel. By adding the silicone in this section here, it secures the cable in place and prevents it from wiggling loose with the firing animation over time. This same procedure I can also recommend for anyone who is working on 116 scale Tamiya or even the Henlong or Tegan flash units as they have a very similar system and can have a possibly have a similar occurrence happen with that of the strobe photostrobe moving along the barrel during the recoil. Like I said before, I used black silicone to anchor the cable in place. Hot glue is another media that can also be used for the exact same purpose on both the 1.6 and 1.16 scale vehicles. Other than the silicone, the rest of the assembly is all out of box armor tech with no mods needing to be made. I will now go ahead and add some lubrication to this portion here of the barrel and then slide it into the barrel cluster. Now, when it comes time for the installation, I will mount the gun from the inside out. It's important to note that currently the muzzle brake is not on the gun, as once the muzzle brake is on the gun, you will not be able to fit it through the small hole that we have here. Now, the gun can also be installed from the outside in, but the reason why I am not, I'm going to be going inside out is due to the lubrication and the grease, which will be added to this section here. If I add the grease and slide it into place, the grease is going to build up towards the front portion of the trunnion, which can possibly wind up on the barrel during the recoil. And it will be a little bit of work to clean up to make sure there's no grease left behind for the painting. However, if you install it vice versa, all of the grease will pull up around this section here and will not get close to being emitted from the front portion of the mantlet. And now the barrel is ready for installation. And the barrel is now into its appropriate recess. As you can see, it smooths very easily and glides along the lubrication and the bearing, which was supplied by the Armatech kit. With the barrel now in place, I can now install the servo, which will be used to connect the barrel via the swinging link and keep everything in place. Once this is done, I can patch in the electric portion to the recoil module from Armortech and hopefully hook everything up and calibrate it. And here's the gun assembly now with the barrel now fitted. As you can see the servo and the supplied arm which were mentioned earlier have been mounted. All the mounting is done with the kit supply fasteners and there are no surprises when it comes to installing these components. Now one quick trick that I did do to the swinging link if I zoom in, you'll see that I went ahead and added a smear of grease to the pivot here, as well as in between where the link meets the arm. As one might imagine, you need to reduce the friction in order for the component to function with more ease. Now, currently the fasteners that are located on the swinging link, as well as to the servo, are only on via hand pressure at the moment, and they are not fully bolted on with Loctite or any other type of additive. The reason for that is that currently the servo still needs to be calibrated. Once I hook up the servo to the electronics and have the, the servo find its zero position, I could then 
adjust the gun barrel so that when the recoil happens, the gun does not, the barrel does not overextend or overextend itself. With the barrel now added, it is now time to move to the recoil systems box. This was the recoil system that I showcased earlier, and only now it has the cover off. You will need to take the cover off in order to hook up the necessary components in order to complete the assembly. Like I said before, I have the servo wire done, and I'm now in the process of hooking up the firing strobes to their respective locations. Like I've said before with the instructions it's very simple you just match the one in the photograph to the version that you see here and the installation goes by fairly easily. Of course you will need the aid of a small Phillips screwdriver as well as a small needle nose plier to facilitate the installation. Once everything is all connected this entire unit here will be ready for function testing, and then finally installation to the actual turret itself. And here we have the wires all synced up with the way they are in the instructions, at which this time I can now re-add the top cover and put the fasteners back on into their locations. The boxes, the enclosures themselves are actually very nicely done. They appear to be made out of die cast metal and overall are very high quality. This goes without saying for the rest of the electronics which are found on these Armatech vehicles. Moving our way to the turret mods, I'm currently finishing off the mods requ required in order to get the gun mounted to its inside of the turret. Some of the mods include, most notably, what I'm finishing off right here, which is that of tapping the holes which are on the turret casting in order to mount on the gun cluster. Now, the holes, like I mentioned before in another video, are all pre-drilled by ArmorTech and are in the correct locations. However, the ArmorTech kit does not have these components as threaded pieces. The way the Armor kit, the ArmorTech kit is designed to be installed is that the gun cluster installs, and then you have bolts and nuts on the inside which need to be tightened in order to secure the turret to the gun. Now one thing I've learned from doing a few of these Sherman builds is that getting access to the interior portion of this turret here specifically with all of the mechanical equipment installed is going to be very difficult. So it is a good idea to go ahead and tap the holes like I'm doing right now with a tap and die. Now also like I mentioned in a previous scene, since the fasteners that I will be utilizing will be standard Imperial slot screws, I went ahead and utilized the same tap that I did for the mantlet and the rotor in order to mount on the same fasteners for this location here. As like on the real Sherman, this component here is actually held on with real slot screws as opposed to hex heads or even Allen bolts. Now, because the tank being a firefly, like I mentioned also in the previous scene, there are only a strip of fasteners on the top and the bottom portion that hold everything in place. The side fastener locations here are not going to be utilized, so they will not be tapped in order to complete the installation on this model. In addition to tapping these holes, another mod that I did was I added the little notch, which is found here on the lower lip of the turret. Moving on to one of the most iconic components of a Firefly, which is that of the counterweight radio box. Now, due to the larger size of the 17-pounder gun, in order to get the gun to fit inside of the turret, the radio and radio compartment needed to have been moved further aft outside the bustle inside of a brand new radio compartment that we have here. In addition to being for the radio, the extra added weight of this large heavy steel metal box counterbalance the weight of the longer gun and gun muzzle which is found on the 17 pounder gun which is used on the Firefly. The Armor Tech kit supplies you with a very basic set to be used for this component here. Just like with many of the other kit supply components, the pieces are very basic to get you off the ground. The set is comprised out of 
these two main pieces as well as several other smaller plates which get bolted to the top portion here which are axis caps which are found on the real bin. The bin itself is one solid piece of CNC aluminum. So quite a substantial bit of aluminum that was used. And there's a bottom plate. The bottom plate simply gets epoxied to the bottom portion of the bin, thus sealing it off and allowing you to bolt it to the rear of the turret via two large fasteners. There are two large fastener holes located on the rear of the bustle of the turret, so no drilling is required. And here goes the bin, now fully reworked and ready for painting as well as installation to the model. As for the piece itself, I went ahead and recycled the original bin from the kit. The original bin was again the appropriate size and offered a really good base to add on the extra accessories in order to kick the box up to the next level. The one portion that was not utilized was that of the bottom. In its place I went ahead and added a plate of clear Lexan plastic. Now if we notice the plate is not the exact same size of the sides and rear. This is done on purpose. The real, the real bin itself that I've seen in photographs has this type of a setup and then it, where these portions all meet each other there will be weld beads. The weld beads on, across the entire bin itself will be added after the installation to the tank's turret. In addition to the bottom plate, I also went ahead and added another plate to the rear portion here, as well as added a spacer riser to the plate itself. This is again taken directly from the real vehicle of which I was studying. As for the sides, spacers were added on them as well. If we notice, the two spacers actually cu curve inward towards the ends and are curved towards the rear portion of the bin. There is also an overhang that encompasses both sides of the bin. This was all fabricated out of styrene strip, which was then glued, shaped, and mounted and puttied into place. The bodywork is all done, making for a nice seamless appearance. As for the lid, rather than using the kit supply parts, I went ahead and fabricated a new lid. The lid itself is made out of a piece of Lexan and the axis caps are made out of sheet styrene. Now it's important to note that I've seen two styles of axis caps, this being the square and the other version are round axis caps with the same type of bolt layout. As for the bolt layout, the bottom row is a straight line, however the top row is straight until it dips down for this corner here. This is due to the make clearance for the antenna well which is found on the turret casting itself. As for why this is not currently mounted onto the piece at the moment, for the simple reason that once the piece is painted it needs to be bolted to the tank and without the lid on I can get access to the two bolts that we have here. Once the piece is bolted to the model the axis cover cap plate will be mounted permanently in place via adhesives. Since this piece here has no load bearing capabilities, adhesives is more than suffice for the installation. And here's the turret, now ready for the main gun installation. In this configuration here, all of the major mods and additions have been made to the turret. These are the type of mods that are made more difficult with the gun already pre-installed and are really best done in the configuration and state that you see here. Starting with the counterweight box, as you can see the counterweight box has been primed and affixed to the model. Here you can also see the addition of the welds that I was mentioning earlier in the previous scene. The welds have been added to all of the appropriate locations to both the top, front, sides, as well as even the bottom. The box is bolted onto the turret with the kit supplied fasteners. There's two very large Allen bolts which are facilitating that of the installation. The bolts are very nicely done and do a fantastic job in holding the piece nice and firmly in place. Of course Loctite is used on this component here as you don't want it to loosen up and wiggle around during operation. Once the bin was added and the welds were sculpted, the top cover plate was then permanently affixed. Here you can see the cover plate with the fastener details. 
But now while in prime, you could see that row that I was referring to earlier where the row of fasteners are straight. However, to work around the large well for the antenna base, the last fastener is off center. Moving our way to the side of the turret takes us to first the left hand side. The Starting with the back, the kit originally had two locations present in the casting for two little lift rings. The lift rings are supplied with the kit, however, are very basic, and rather than using the kit supplied lift rings, I went ahead and used a set of my own resin ones. These components here are for detail purposes only and are not intended for actual lifting of the turret. The locations are also very different. The locations that Armortech has already in the piece is in this location here on top of the bustle. However, the majority of the Sherman tanks I've seen, the lift ring is in this lower portion here. This is a reverse image on the opposite side. Moving our way to the shell ejection port. The shell ejection port you see here was also supplied with Armortech, however, again, was not utilized. The in its place, I went ahead and used a resin set from EastCoastArmory.com in which the piece is actually going to be made fully functional. Here I have the actual hatch with its interior detailing. As you see, I already had and added the base coat of the olive drab for the interior of both the hatch well as well as the hatch itself. After the hatch gets some basic airbrushing, it will then be fitted to the turret as the way you see it here. Now, it's important to note that the ArmorTech version is made out of a single piece of CNC aluminum and is non-functional. The this is not an this is not an inaccuracy as there were several designs of Sherman turrets that were coming out of the foundry as the shell ejection port went through several alterations in the United States by the government. Some versions had the shell ejection port that was functional. Others deemed the shell ejection port to be a weak point in the armor and was some versions had the plate welded over, as well as some either had just a plug that was never machined out, as well as some Shermans just had nothing there altogether. The version that Armortech gives you is replicating that of the unmilled plug, which the turret would come out of the foundry from the mold and they would never mill out the portion. However, rather than using that or modeling that version of the Sherman turret, I went ahead and went with the functional hatch for the simple reason that since the tank is radio controlled, sometimes you do need to get access into the turret for whatever reason. You do have an extra access point into the side of the turret via the hatch here. So it's more for access rather than for detailing necessarily. Moving on to, towards the front of the turret takes us to the footman loops that we have here. The footman loops that we have in this cluster here is a unique feature found on British Shermans. They're in a, this exact pattern in which you have six, three in a row on top and bottom, which is parallel to each other, and a single one found on the front of the turret. The footman loops are scratch built, and I use the same method that I utilize for the tool footman loops, which are found in the previous video, as well as even in all my other 1-6 scale Sherman vids. Moving towards the front takes us to the front blister. Now, one feature found on Sherman tank turrets with a 75 millimeter gun is that there was an integral blister found in the Sherman tank casting. This blister is emitted on the Armor Tech kit and was added for this build. The blister was sculpted out of epoxy and then was flared into the turret's cast texturing with that of my cast texturing surface. Moving to the opposite side, I already discussed the notch, which was mentioned earlier, which then takes us to probably one of the other most noticeable additions made to the turret, which is that of the turret cheek armor. As for the armor itself, this is not included with the armor tech kit, and this piece here is scratch built. The part is actually sculpted onto the tank with that of epoxy. It is not fabricated out of plates of plastic that have been fused or sculpted into the shape that you see here. Instead, epoxy was added and sculpted in order to get the correct geometry. The reason for that is that due to the shape of the Sherman's turret, you're gonna be having a lot of round curvature angles to deal with. And getting a, a piece of plastic with this thickness to bend the contour around this geometry is very difficult to do. So the sculpted technique was utilized. This is actually pretty unique as this is the first time I actually used this technique on a model, specifically for a component that's this large. 
As for the epoxy, once it's dried, I went ahead and did the bodywork, make sure it's nice and smooth. And then the sculpted cast or the sculpted weld beads have been added in this format. As you can see, the plates that we have here are actually comprised out of two pieces, which are fitted and then welded together to form the cheek armor that we all seen on many Shermans throughout time. Moving our way back, the side of the tart is actually pretty sparse of any detailing. We have the other lift ring, which I mentioned earlier, as well as the deletion of the armor tech mounts, which again, I discussed in a previous scene. Moving our way to the turret's top detailing. Now currently, there this is only a portion of the detailing which will be added to the turret as there's going to be a few more additions added as the build progresses past this point. However, we'll just take a quick gloss over on what was currently added. First, starting with this plate with fasteners. This is a component that is found on the fireflies that I've seen that are still in existence. As for its actual intended purpose, that I am unaware of. If anyone does know the actual purpose of this piece of equipment, feel free to mention it in the comments section listed below. As for the detail itself, it's a simple steel bracket which is welded to the tank in these two locations. There are then three fasteners located in this triangular appearance and the fasteners themselves are actually dome slot screws which are protruding through the steel and then are fastened in place with that of a small nut. The fasteners that you see on here are identical to the ones found on the real units with the use of the dome slot screws. Moving our way to the smoke grenade launcher just like with many other Sherman tanks as well as USAV in general from the period there is a small smoke grenade launcher located in this portion here of the turret. Now, as for the detailing of the grenade launcher itself, it's that of a simple tube with sculpted weld bead detailing added around. Now, what makes the British Shermans very distinctive compared to their American counterparts is the protective gutter. On American tanks, to seal off this, look, this tube here from any type of rain that would possibly enter into the vehicle, as the tube is just a pipe sticking out of the turret in a vertical manner. The Americans had a rubberized cap, which was chain retained, that would simply plug into this location and have a piece of dangling chain. The British, on the other hand, did the design that you see here, in which they have a ovular gutter mechanism, which is found and welded directly around the smoke grenade launcher. I believe the British also had either a rubber or a canvas cover which would snap over this location here thoroughly sealing it off from the elements. The component itself is not only has its flat rim on the top however it's elevated from the turret surface. The component that you see here is a new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line and is all fabricated out of soldered sheet metal. Moving our way to the center blower and the gunner scope these two Components are resin versions from EastCoastArmory.com. The blower insert is the same one found on the hull as well as on several of the other Sherman builds which have been posted online. As for the gunner scope insert itself, this is another recent addition to the ECA product line. To add this component, rather than using the ArmorTech one, you the piece fits very well, however it's some hand fitting with a Dremel is required around the molded in tub in order to get the piece to fit in in a better format compared to just leaving it raw. Now the component still has some fastener detailing which to be added as well as a distinctive British pattern brush guard which we fabricate out of brass rod which will be added in the next upcoming video. Another bit of detailing that was added to the turret roof which is a unique feature found on the earlier pattern of Sherman's is that of these three round lugs which are integrally casted into the turret's casing. On the real Sherman tank, these three bosses here were a design feature which were carryovers from the pilot model of the Sherman as well as even dates back to the M3 Lee. The purpose of these lugs is that these lugs here were originally intended for how you would remove the turret from the tank. The way the lugs functioned was that they were drilled in the centers and they were tapped. To actually use them, you would take 
large eyelets and thread them into these three locations here. The three eyelets then give you a clipping location for the crane to have its three, these three locations clipped in order for you to hoist up the turret via crane. Now this was before the design of the three large hooks that we see on this model and that we all know and come to know for that of Sherman's. The design, like I said, is dates back to the M3 Lee and that's actually how the turrets are removed from the M3 Lee series. The pilot model of Sherman carried this design over and this design was also found on, I believe, several of the very early initial production M4 and M4A1 Shermans. However, once production cranked up, this design was quickly dropped in favor of the three large lift rings that are found on the turret. Even though these three locations are not utilized, the lugs themselves were still present on the early versions of the Sherman turret, like this one that we have here. They were just simple mounds and were just left as such. The later versions of the Sherman tanks turret had these three lugs thoroughly deleted and removed. And here goes the turret now mounted to the body of the model. All of the electronic connections for the main gun elevation as well as the barrel recoil have all been plugged into their appropriate locations. In addition to doing this, I also went ahead and fine-tuned the turret rotation by removing some certain material in some spots, thus freeing up the surfaces even more, allowing for the turret to spin a lot more smoothly. I'm going to go ahead and first test the turret rotation. Currently the model is off and I will be turning on the model. Of course, like always, you first use the turn on the radio and then I will turn on the tank. Now when the tank turns on, since the recoil system is patched in, the gun will run its recoil power-up procedure, to which then point the model is under your control. So I'll first turn on, and like I said, the radio is on, turning on the tank. As you saw, the recoil activated. And now I will turn on the engine sound. rotates very smooth. Now currently there's actually no grease on between the turret and the bearing ring. The grease is still going to be added as it does make the turret glide on the bushing with a lot more efficiency. However this again will be added as the build progresses. But for the piece to rotate this smooth right now is a very good sign. I will now test the gun elevation and depression which is controlled by this stick here. Side to side, lowers the gun. As you can see, the gun is at its lowest possible point, to which no matter how much I push on the toggle, it will not go any further beyond this, which can cause damage to the motor. This is as per the Armatech system. I can only now go in the reverse direction, which will in turn raise the gun, as you can clearly see. Same thing, it hit its limit now for the maximum elevation. Now I'm going to get the gun to its center point, to which here I am free to go up or down if desired. Now currently the gun, like I said, the recoil and the flash system were all hooked up to the tank's electronics. However, currently I'm still trying to make everything calibrated with that of the radio. And more information on this is to come as the build progresses. But this is a huge step now out of the way. Like I said before, the turret getting up to this 
point here is a huge, huge step now out of the way. And now I can focus on the rest and the last of the tanks her details as well as the last of the hull fittings that are required to finish off the model and get it ready for painting. More information on this is to come in the next following video. However, with that, that concludes this project update video for this 1-6 scale ArmorTech British 5 Firefly Sherman. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook and don't forget to check out eastcoastarmory.com for more 1-6 and 1-16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.